high water levels, storm surges, sand erosion, dropping trees, eroding infrastructure, blowout events. Presque Isle, the Pennsylvania State Park, located in Erie, Pennsylvania, faces various threats. How did we get here? What's happening? What is being done? What can be done? That is what we're going to work to unpack with Dr. David Frew, Jefferson Educational Society scholar in residence in this installment of the Accidental Paradise Digital Programming Series. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. 194 pages, full color, hardcover, dust jacket, and all Accidental Paradise, 13,000 year history of Presque Isle. The recently published book features Presque Isle's natural history, uh, colorful political history, including its creation as a state park in 1921. It also looks at the environment and those aforementioned threats. Important note up front, folks, uh, published by the JES in cooperation with the Tom Ridge Environmental Center Foundation. I want to thanks the, thank the folks at Trek uh, for their partnership in this process. For more information on how, where, when uh, to purchase that book, please do visit the website accidentalparadise.com. Now, joining me here is one of the book's uh, authors, Dr. David Fru. He's a scholar in residence at the JES, an emeritus professor at Gannon University, um, where he held a variety of administrative positions um, and faculty positions during a 33-year-long career. Uh, he's also the emeritus director of the Erie County Historical Society, the Hagen History Center, uh, where he had previously served as the executive director for five years and is president of his own management consulting uh, consulting business. He has authored or co-authored uh, 40 books, including Accidental Paradise, which brings us here for this conversation, as well as more than 100 articles, cases, and papers, including his prolific On the Waterfront series for the JES. For a fuller bio, head over to our website, jeserie.org. Now, folks, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comment section below. If you're watching or listening to a later broadcast of this event, still send us your questions, your comments, keep this conversation going. And for more information about uh, upcoming JES programs and publications, do visit that website, jeserie.org. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Dr. David Frew, thank you for joining us for this, this discussion in this program. Thanks for having me, Ben. All right, Dr. Fru, I'm going to pull up your slide deck and share that with everybody so we get a chance to go through that. So high water alert, Presque Isle at risk. That's what we're looking at here in this installment of the Accidental Paradise JES Digital Programming Series. Let's go to your first slide. 2020 Perfect. blowouts at Presque Isle. What are they? Why are we worried about them? What's going on in these two striking images that we see here on the screen? Somebody biking through and somebody else driving through water, uh, dropped trees. Uh, what are we looking at, Dr. Frew? Well, on, on the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, the, the summer of 2020 and one of the uh, several blowouts that occurred uh, during the high water periods. High water uh, seasonally is uh, usually in May and June. The uh, water then slowly drops until September. Uh, what we see on the left-hand side is a road where there is a blowout, and the technical definition of a blowout on a sand spit is a moment in time when the water is running from one side of the sand spit to the other. If you were the owner, operator, uh, perpetrator, manager of a sand spit that stuck straight out into the lake, and uh, you had a blowout where the water was running across the spit going from one side to the other, that would be a little disconcerting. But when you have one that has uh, one side on Presque Isle Bay and the other side on Stormy Lake Erie, it's even more disconcerting. What you see on the right-hand side is the all-purpose trail uh, near the head of the peninsula. And you can see there that the water has uh, run over the, the all-purpose trail. And to get to the all-purpose trail, it had to uh, run across the uh, 50 or 60 yards of uh, brush and trees. And uh, those are a lot of uh, trees that don't mind having their feet wet. However, uh, once the trees have been soaked uh, too long, uh, they'll start to collapse. You can see there a couple of trees are down already. So those are blowouts from last summer. Uh, there were blowouts in 1990, or, or 2019 as well. And there was one particular blowout last early spring. We don't have a picture of it where the water ran 
uh, from the uh, ferry landing at Waterworks all the way across Waterworks over the ponds and into the lake. So Dr. Fru, I, I, for those less familiar with the term blowout, or we only see it when we hear about it in the news, you know, when you're talking about water going from the bay to the lake, what is the depth of that? Is it just a trickle? Is any amount considered a blowout? How much? What does the depth look like? And, and just what's, I, I suppose, overall significant about keeping this in mind? Well, it wasn't deep enough to carry people away. It wasn't more than four or five, six inches at peak. But what's important and useful to think about with respect to Presque Isle is Presque Isle is a floating sand spit. So if you were to go anywhere on Presque Isle with a post hole digger and dig a two foot hole, even in low water times in the middle of the summer, you'd encounter water. So we have a very thin layer of sand with some brush and trees and roots holding it all together. And when you get a blowout like this, it makes uh, things worse. And so we're talking about a sand spit. Tell us a little bit about the dynamics of that um, and the science behind it and what we're looking at when we think of the sand movement that's occurring on a place like Presque Isle. Well, here's a, a helicopter or aerial view of uh, Presque Isle and the waters surrounding it. And uh, where you're looking at the water and you can see uh, you know, lighter colors, uh, that's an indication that sand is moving. So sand can't go in solution in water, but it certainly can be carried by water. And uh, the sand in Lake Erie tends to move from the uh, west to the east, from southwest to northeast to be technically correct, or from left to right uh, here. So that anytime there's a wind, uh, either a traditional southwester wind or the, uh, the annoying nor'easters, uh, those currents uh, hit the sand that's on the edges of the beaches or wherever and lift the sand up and put it in the water and move it. They just carry it, transport it. And, and do we see a particular part of a uh, geographical location where most of the sand ends up once it's moving, once it, it, it reaches, it, it leaves Presque Isle? Do we see that uh, collecting somewhere a majority of it? Well, when the, when the wind blows from the northeast, the sand kind of blows uh, down the peninsula in, in a way that maybe it can be recovered. But once uh, sand is transported way past the peninsula out into the deeper waters of the lake, the eastern basin, it sinks to the bottom and it's gone forever. It's not recoverable. Well, I think that leads us to our next natural question is, where did the sand come from to begin with? What are we looking at here on the screen, Dr. Fru? We have a picture of a glacier on the left, and that's a sim simulated uh, notion of what the Wisconsin glacier looked like. But to fully appreciate the Wisconsin glacier, which came to us from the north, passed us, and went uh, maybe to the middle of Pennsylvania before it stalled out. And then when the climate got warmer, it reversed course and backed up. Uh, when the glacier was at its peak, uh, it was probably a mile high. Uh, over the city of Erie, which is an unbelievable thing to imagine. And if you can imagine a slab of ice slowly moving at glacial speed, of course, uh, it's picking up everything it can get its hands on, freezing it into the ice, grinding it into sand. And then when it turned and reversed courses and backed up and went back to the north, the sand dropped out. So what you see on the right-hand side uh, the left-hand side is a wimpy little glacier that may be 100 or 150 feet tall, uh, someplace probably in Alaska. Uh, what you see on the right-hand side is a uh, sand park, which is on the other side of the lake, just a little bit west of the, the base of Long Point, which is a peninsula, which is right across the peninsula from Presque Isle. It's quite like Presque Isle in formation. It's a sand spit, three times as big. And uh, to give you a sense of how much sand was dropped uh, by the glacier, uh, that's called Sand Dunes Park. And uh, you see there's a person standing at the bottom. And those are sand dunes that are, you know, three, 400 feet high. I think that, that that was my curiosity of how much sand gets dropped out as the glacier is moving. And, and so on the right image there, that's a person that I think I'm moving my cursor along. That's correct. That's a person standing at the edge of the water and behind that person, uh, you have to sort of think backwards. This person, of course, this sand dune is on the other side of the lake, so it's facing toward Erie. Uh, that person is standing next to Sand Dune Park, which is a fun place to go and 
appreciate how big sand dunes can be. And I don't want to jump ahead as a possible solution, but I don't think we're getting a glacier again anytime soon to replenish the sand we're losing. It's likely that we won't get another glacier in our lifetimes. Well, what I'd like to hear you talk about, Dr. Fru, is, is the, the Great Lakes as this river sea, the Iroquois River Sea. And uh, tell us what we're looking at here on the screen, the, the Great Lakes system profile as, as we're looking at the collective watershed. Well, that's a side view of uh, the Great Lakes. And what you can see by looking at that side view is that uh, Lake Superior on the extreme left-hand side is extraordinarily deep as compared to Lake Erie, uh, maybe you could put your cursor on Lake Erie. That's the little wimpy shallow thing there. It's got a couple hundred feet deep in the deepest spot, but uh, compared, compared to Lake Ontario or Lake Superior or Lake Michigan, it's not very deep at all. And uh, it's important to understand that Lake Erie is a part of a system of Great Lakes. Uh, the Iroquois, when they came here and saw how the lakes worked, and they were of course stationed up against Lake Erie, in Lake Ontario, uh, they could see that it looks like it looked like a sea, and they had a vision of what a sea was like because they came from Montreal originally. But it also behaved like a river, so uh, the Iroquois called this a, a river sea. They had the same uh, uh, native word for both Lake Erie and for uh, Lake Ontario. So I know that I, I took the cursor and, and moved it to show folks there that you've got Lake Superior all the way on the left, then Lake Erie, the third one in. Uh, am I seeing Niagara Falls there too? Am I circling yeah, that, yeah. that that's on our profile? What you see is the uh, distance between uh, the bottom of Lake Erie and the top of Lake uh, Ontario represents the height, not just of Niagara Falls, but also the Niagara River. So uh, the reason why the early explorers called all the lakes other than Lake Ontario, the upper lakes is because you had to figure out how to get up and over that uh, 400 and some foot rise uh, to get to Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron and Lake Superior. I, I just can't imagine trying to seeing that for the first time and trying to understand how to navigate up and over that to get to another part of the, this watershed. <laughs> Portages. <laughs> So the St. Lawrence Seaway, which we saw on the very right uh, of that image that we just took a look at, uh, talk to us about the importance of the St. Lawrence Seaway here um, and the connection to the Atlantic Ocean and then inwards all the way uh, over to Duluth. Well, in 1959, after uh, years of negotiating, uh, two countries uh, cooperated in opening the St. Lawrence Seaway. And in effect, what that was doing was moving the Atlantic Ocean to Duluth. And the attractive reason why you wanted to get to Duluth is uh, iron. Uh, that's where the iron ore came from, still comes from. And uh, as we were constructing the St. Lawrence Seaway, we were allowing ocean going ships to come here and move inland from the Atlantic. So it finally opened in 1959. It's 2,200 miles long. And in the original construction, they used the old canals and the locks, which were uh, too small and uh, too old fashioned uh, to be as viable as we wanted them to be. It's been continuously changing since 59. We've been upgrading canals and adding larger locks. The most significant increase was the uh, expansion of the Sioux locks. That's how you get from Lake Superior to the Michigan Huron Erie Lake levels. Uh, in 1970, they expanded those locks so that they could hold 1,000 foot ships. And those are the, the mega ships like the Presque Isle that was built in Erie or the Stuart Court that was built in Erie. And there are others now, there are probably 30 of them uh, roaming up and down the lakes, maybe 24, 25. And each of those is so enormously huge and, and techn technologically equipped to carry iron ore, taconite these days, or coal or grain, if need be, uh, that they've displaced uh, maybe a dozen of the old fashioned ships. Now, what's scary and interesting about the process of creating the St. Lawrence Seaway is it was, it was necessary to raise the St. Lawrence River 18 inches. And this is a benchmark for understanding what happens when you raise a body of water 18 inches. Now this of course is in a river valley, so it wasn't as dreadful as you would find 18 inches done on, on a lake shore like at Lake Erie. But the raising of the St. Lawrence River 18 inches displaced 50,000 people. 
of the 50,000 people, 85% were Native North Americans. And that's a tragedy, uh, what happened to those Native North Americans. Uh, most of them were on the Canadian side uh, and they were moved to the Hudson Bay. In considering the overall effect of the St. Lawrence Seaway, the incredible change in commerce aside, it would largely be seen as a general environmental disaster for a dozen reasons. It seems to me that this would not be something that would be able to be pulled off in its iteration how it was then. It wouldn't be able to be done today. No, this would never happen again. Uh, uh, you know, what, one of the things that we're watching these days is the introduction of, uh, of species that came here from Europe. Uh, invasive species, the most interesting and, and well-known of them would be the, the zebra mussels and the round gobies. Those were released from the bilge water of European ships that came here. They uh, fill up with bilge water so that they can negotiate the Atlantic without bouncing over the waves. As soon as they're into the, uh, into the lakes, uh, they, let the, they, they let the bilge water go so they can load up. And, and the introduction of those invasive species uh, into this habitat, uh, what results are we seeing? Because uh, certain fish are, are going to naturally then feed on a, a new food system introduced into their food chain, right? Yeah, what we now know is that the, uh, the, the gobies are eating the uh, uh, zebra mussels. Zebra mussels uh, just filter everything. And for some reason, they seem to be tasty to the gobies. And uh, now what we know is if you're purchasing a commercially caught fish from Lake Erie, which you could do at Wegmans on any day, uh, there are still commercial fishing on the Canadian side of Lake Erie. The average perch that's caught on Lake Erie has somewhere around 1.7 or 1.8 uh, gobies in his stomach or her stomach. So uh, when all these environmental uh, nasties showed up here, uh, we immediately thought that it was going to be like, like lights out uh, for, for, for the lake, that they were going to destroy the lake. What in fact happened is that they, the, the, the uh, populations of those things sort of became controlled by existing creatures. So what we see if we go out to the lake and we take a look, we see 20 or 30 times as many predatory fish uh, as we used to see they're eating the perch and the perch are eating and, and they're doing quite well actually eating the gobies. And looking at the displacement of the natives, where where were they moved to? And, and this doesn't seem like they had much agency or choice in this of we're raising the St. Lawrence River, you need to move, we are relocating you. Where did they go? Uh, tell us a little bit more behind that. M many, but not all of the Native Americans or Native Canadians to be more, more uh, correct, were moved to the Hudson Bay because uh, there seemed to be plenty of space up there. But as soon as they got them there, they realized that they weren't going to be able to make a living there because they didn't know how to deal with the environment. So they provided the displaced Native Canadians uh, with uh, snowmobiles and houses and diesel engines and, and guns and ammunition so they could go out and shoot uh, seals. And as they did that, uh, that became a threat to the Inuit uh, who said, wait a minute, these new guys that you put here and you're supporting with all this technology are taking all the stuff that we used to eat away from us. So we need that too. So they created a chaos uh, by, by displacing those people. Not everybody went, some of them dispersed. And then it, it, again, it seems like a, a lesson we're not thinking out in the time in terms of the impact of this and what we can do relocating people, an environmental disaster. But let's move on. Let's take a look at trying to answer the question of, of how water gets in and out of Lake Erie. Because if we go back to that image we just saw on a few slides ago, uh, we might remember that Lake Erie is uh, remarkably shallow compared to the others. And, and at least I had always heard uh, that it's the most replenished lake because it's the shallowest. So the water's turning over at a higher rate than any of the other Great Lakes. It does, but that's sort of a, uh, a metric that doesn't make too much sense. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't mean much of anything. In uh, the sense of how Lake Erie gets its water, uh, the main inflow and outflow come from the Detroit River on the west end, that's how it gets in, and the Niagara River on the east end, that's how it gets out. 
But in addition to the inflow and the outflow, uh, we have precipitation in the form of rain and snow. So for example, when all the snow that we've gotten in the last few weeks melts, if it's any place melting in the Lake Erie Basin, which is larger than you I could, could imagine, it's going to run uh, one or another way into the lake. And there's also runoff that comes from uh, municipal uh, sources, stormwater, for example, and creeks. Uh, that's how water generally moves. Uh, we should also add the fact that uh, sunlight tends to evaporate uh, the water from the lake. So here's a strange statistic. On average, 12 additional hours of sun over a season will evaporate one inch from the surface of the lake. So uh, think like if last year there was a thousand hours of sun and uh, next year because of possible global warming, uh, there's gonna be a thousand and twenty-four uh, hours of sun that we would expect uh, two inches to disappear from the surface of Lake Erie. And that's why on balance, people that were thinking and trying to calculate the impact of global warming were predicting that the lake was going to uh, get, the, the lake level was gonna go down. Um, in the entire Great Lakes system, there are only three drain valves, uh, but they don't work as effectively as the drain valve in your bathtub. Uh, there's one at the Sioux Locks. So every time they lock ships through from Lake Superior to Lake Michigan, uh, water flows from Superior into Lake Michigan. Now, uh, they don't lock enough ships through there uh, to make a huge dent in Lake Superior. Uh, you could argue that if you desperately needed uh, to lower Lake Superior, you could leave uh, the locks open. However, uh, that would raise the level of water on Lake Erie, and nobody here wants any more water right now. The second valve is at Chicago, but it's a negative valve. And if anyone has visited Chicago and gone on the uh, architectural tour, if you'll recall, you get on a, a boat, a, a tour boat, uh, like a ferry boat in the lake, in Lake Michigan, and then you go up a lock or two or three and you get into the Chicago River. And every time they open and close that lock, you get negative drainage. That means you got water coming in uh, that wasn't apt to want to go in from the Chicago River. Uh, the biggest and most usable valve is at the, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the St. Lawrence River, at the end of Lake Ontario. If you've been to the Thousand Islands, it's right at the, right at the uh, gateway to the Thousand Islands. So technically, uh, we could open up that valve and let water out of Lake Ontario. And if we think we have problems with high water on Lake Erie, uh, our problems are insignificant as compared to the problems they're having in Lake Ontario right now. Uh, the issue, however, is uh, if we were to let the water out of the St. Lawrence, into the St. Lawrence River from Lake Ontario, that would raise the level of the St. Lawrence River and recalling the damage we did there in 1959 when we raised it 18 inches, uh, it's, it's not politically popular to think about raising the St. Lawrence River at all. When, and I, I, I'm glad you brought that number back up because I wanted people to hold on to that, that 18 inches, I, I think just to a casual listener or observer might not sound like a lot when you think of 18 inches of rising, the raising the water. Um, but small changes have big impacts. Yeah, there's a place in the book where you can go and uh, calculate uh, how much shoreline is lost when you raise something 18 inches. A uh, little example from the history of Erie is when uh, the, the canal was built from Erie to Pittsburgh or Beaver, uh, it was necessary uh, to raise Conneaut Lake 11 feet. And when they raised Conneaut Lake 11 feet, uh, the shoreline moved in some places almost a mile. That was a disaster for people that lived anywhere near Conneaut Lake. But of course, back in the 1830s when they were doing that, no one lived there. And I, I think the other number I want to point out before we move on and, and take a look at some of, of the history behind Lake Erie and, and, and other topics is, is that sunlight, 12 hours, one inch. Now that might not sound like a lot or that might sound like a lot to people in, in terms of that. Uh, can you just shed more light, pun fully intended, Dr. Fru, on that for us of, of what we're looking at when we think of direct sunlight on the lake manipulating uh, an inch at a time with 12 hours of sunlight accumulated? Well, for that to do it, the water has to be open. 
So if we had a traditional winter and there was ice over the top of the lake, this wouldn't happen. But if you uh, excise the ice from the lake, as we have in recent years because of warming trends, uh, and we imagine that there's going to be more and more and more sunlight, uh, then a big concern is the evaporation. And the water that evaporates from Lake Erie goes up and it joins the clouds and it scoots along and it comes back down out of the Lake Erie Basin. So that's a loss. And uh, those speculations, which were a uh, concern for environmentalists uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, caused people to think that uh, we might lose so much water in Lake Erie that we were going to have trouble uh, maintaining channels and shipping, etc. And so I want to take us on to that history, Lake Erie, and the hydrodynamics there. So uh, originally, we're looking at two lakes, not just one. Uh, teach us our history, Dr. Frew. Well, during glacial times, uh, as the lake was uh, taking shape, there were originally two lakes. One of them was essentially just west of Presque Isle, and it was shallow. And the other lake was deep. And we have pictures that we'll show you of this in a moment. And that one was deep. The two lakes were connected by a channel. It's called the Pennsylvania Channel. The Pennsylvania Channel is still there. So as uh, the, the glacier was moving north and uh, the weight shifted from right over the lake to the north part of the lake and the, uh, the banks of the lake heaved, uh, the lake filled up with water. Uh, the water that was running to Niagara Falls uh, moved. And uh, we had uh, one lake rather than two. We have a picture of that in, in a minute as well. But the channel is still there and it serves an important purpose. Uh, since Lake Erie is oriented in exactly the same direction as the prevailing wind, it's prone to having sand spits, especially since all that sand was deposited here. And interestingly, the water that's rushing east uh, gets to the Niagara River at the, at the uh, east end of Lake Erie, but it can't fit through, into, the, into the basin. So it turns around and comes back backwards. So uh, like a lot of uh, closed water systems, the Mediterranean comes to mind. Uh, what you have, if you go and look at uh, the lake current, is you have uh, a relentless current from west to east on the top of the water. And then when you go down 15, 20 feet, uh, you have a relentless current from east to west, backwards from the top. Uh, so this subsurface -sur reverse current is what controls the balance of the lake and what allows it to uh, be like uh, controlled so that it's in equilibrium at all times, and this is still happening, is the Pennsylvania Channel. So if you go down into the Pennsylvania Channel, which of course geology type people do, and measure the current there, which is washing uh, wildly uh, from the east to the west, uh, it washes harder uh, when you get a top current that's bouncing off the Niagara River. Lake Erie cannot possibly be drained. And all the people that are looking at the high water and ask the question, oh, why don't we just drain it? Uh, they just don't understand that that can't be done. And by the way, the water level of Lake Erie is a part of a, a middle system. Lake Huron, the Georgian Bay, Lake Michigan, and Lake St. Clair are, all have the same uh, water level. And, and when we think about the Pennsylvania Channel, is, is that common, uncommon? What other examples might we, we know of or uh, you know, lakes, seas that we could look to to, to know, you know how common is this? How often do we see this? Totally uncommon. Uh, it's only there by virtue of the fact that in, uh, in archaeological or geological time, uh, there was a, an existing channel. So if we uh, move forward and look at some pictures, we can see it and see how it works. Let's, let's do that in a second, but let's talk about the storm surges first and we'll get to that photo. Yes, I, I guess what we're now, we're, we're concerned about the water being too high. We're not, somehow we've lost our, our worry that the, the water is all gonna go away. At least we're not gonna worry about that for the next 50 or 100 years. So we'll start with the fact that there is something called the chart datum of 571 feet. Lake Erie, the, the, the chart datum, which is not the average, this is something that was developed uh, for the purpose of navigation, is 571 feet above sea level. And it's gonna lose about 400 of those feet, uh, the water, when it drops down the Niagara River and over the falls. 
Uh, there has been an observed but non-theoretical 30-year water cycle on Lake Erie and its other companion lakes. Uh, I've spent all kinds of time talking to experts in limnology, uh, people that have focused their attention on Lake Erie to try to see if there's anyone that would understand a theoretical explanation for this system. I've, I, I can't find one. I don't think anybody knows about one. So in a 30 or 31 year cycle, depending upon how we look over history, the water is high, it goes low and it goes high again. So every 30 or 31 years, it's high. And then every 30 or 31 years in the middle, it's low. So for example, here's some high water years. 1912, it was 572 feet. 1931, 571. 1952, 572. 1972, 573. 1986, 574. Uh, that was the last high water cycle until recent years. Now let's look at some low water years. 1934, it was 568. 1964, it was 569. And I remember that year well because large ships that were berthed at the docks uh, were sitting on the ground and tilted over. They had to be tied and uh, cabled so they wouldn't fall over. In 2002, it went down to 570 feet. 2013, it was, went down to 569 feet. So that makes the range throughout those years 6.6 .6 feet. And if you start thinking about the impact of 6.6 .6 feet on the lake shore, now that's enormous. Remember 11 feet uh, raised uh, it moved the shoreline of Conneaut Lake a mile. Uh, the recent record levels. Now, do a little arithmetic. If there was a natural high water uh, mark uh, back in 2013, uh, sorry, high water mark uh, 86, we should have been experiencing another high water mark in maybe 2017. Uh, and in 2017, we did have a fairly high water mark, but it kept going up. It didn't go back down as we'd expected it to. So uh, the, the, the water level was a record in 2019 at 575 feet. And it was another record in two, uh, 2020 at 578 feet. And if you add those to the 1986 level, which was a previous high actually, uh, you're looking at an additional six feet on top of the range. And, and Dr. Fur, I think people are, uh, if they're like me, they're curious, how fast do we get this data? Where, and how, how do we know, um, uh, how do we start tracking 2021? Because if I'm looking just two years in the past, I'm seeing a three foot increase uh, from 2019 to 2020. And I'm, I'm getting a little itchy about what 2021 might look like. I, I, are we tracking this data in real time, measuring these levels, reporting them out, uh, or do we have to wait until December 31st, uh, 2021 and uh, calculate that in 2022? No, you can go to your go Google machine and see what the level is today. Tom well, you can't see tomorrow. You could, you could see it day by day by day by day back to the uh, beginning of recorded lake levels. Let's talk about the sand arriving and sand washing away. Um, talk about the equilibrium that's created around this sand spit. Well, here's how the sand, sand spit works. Sand comes and it deposits itself on the shore. And then water comes, waves, and washes it away. And if the same amount of sand comes as is washed away, the sand spit lives on in, in equilibrium and, and in perpetuity. It won't get any smaller. But if we end up with more water washing or more sand washing away than sand arriving, then the sand spit's going to get smaller, 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 smaller until it may become threatened. So a couple things to think about. The Wisconsin glacier is not coming back. Uh, we know that the water in Lake Erie transports sand from the southwest to the northeast relentlessly. We know that sand came to us by washing down feeder creeks and into the lake. We know that also sand comes to us by collapsing into the lake as bluffs erode. So if you remember that picture we showed of the, the sand dunes park uh, west of Long Point, one of the reasons why Long Point is so enormous as compared to Presque Isle is that there was more sand on the north side of Lake Erie and much more sand came to sand spits from eroding bluffs than from sand washing down feeder creeks. So here's the realities of life in 2021. The creeks have already emptied most of the available sand. There's not gonna be a lot more sand coming down creeks. Homeowners with very expensive homes sitting on the edges 
of bluffs where they would not be allowed to uh, build anymore, are willing to spend an unim unimaginable amount of money to stabilize the bluffs so that their houses don't collapse and fall into the lake. Uh, there's all kinds of, of pictures that you can find on your Googler of Lake Erie houses collapsing and dropping into Lake Erie. And as that's happening, homeowners are well aware of that. And they're hiring uh, specialists that are stabilizing their bluffs. So uh, lots of the sand that used to come to us from bluffs is not coming anymore. Also munip municipalities and in particular Conneaut. Conneaut was a particularly rich source of sand for Presque Isle. But a few years back, Connie had figured out that maybe they'd like to keep the sand that they had that was washing up on uh, the west side of their town. And they put breaker walls out there and they're creating beaches and making uh, recreational opportunities. So if you get to Connie or you can uh, go to Google Earth and look at Connie uh, if you could go back and look at successive old Google Earth, Earth pictures of Connie, you'll see that there's uh, sand piling up on the beach at Conneaut, uh, which was never there before. Uh, also, and we said this before, uh, once the sand gets past Presque Isle and is carried by the water, it falls out of the water. It's not in solution, it's just being carried. And it uh, drops to the bottom and joins the muck on the bottom and there's no way of recovering it. And Dr. Free, you, you mentioned the breakers in Conneaut, and I, I think those of us who enjoy spending time on the beaches of Presque Isle, uh, we see the breakers there. And, and while not the most aesthetically pleasing things, if they're there to serve a function and to keep the sand, uh, why not install more, uh, create longer, bigger breakers? Is this something that we can do to keep the sand, to keep from losing the sand? Because like you said, once it's gone, it's gone. Well, those uh, rock mound uh, uh, piles that you see offshore, they were very controversial when the, when the Corps of Engineers uh, originally proposed them. There were lots of expert people that said that it was a very bad idea. One of the problems with them is that whatever it costs to put them there, it would cost hundreds of times that much to take them away if we decided that they weren't working. Now, on balance, as skeptical as I was at the beginning of this, I think they've done a good job. I think without them, the peninsula would be in way worse shape than it is <coughs> with respect to uh, sand erosion. And one of the functions of those breakers, if you could see them uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the helicopter view, and you can see these pictures on Google, every one of those breakers has a, uh, has a sort of a scalloped pointed bit of sand heading from the beach out to it. And so it acts uh, to capture and slow down and stop the sand all by itself. And those, uh, those pointer things are called tombolos with the letter T. And the idea of that is that every once in a few years, we can go out there with high lifts and dig up that uh, captured sand and spread it on the beaches directly so that we don't have to go anyplace else and harvest it. So let's take a look at the archaic vestiges, the deep eastern lake and the shallow western lake. You mentioned before uh, that prior, this was actually, we were looking at not just one lake, but two. Yes, and if you think about uh, uh, Long Point and the peninsula as being the place where the two met, uh, there is still a 90-foot tall moraine rising off the floor that, that runs from the base of Long Point to the base of Presque Isle. And if we just go to the next slide, we could see the details of that. Uh, if you were magically able to, and this of course is a boyhood fantasy of mine, drain all the water from the lake so you could go walk around and bottom and see things. Were you walking along the lake bottom from west to east, starting maybe somewhere around Conneaut, uh, if in the middle of the lake you would find yourself uh, encountering this moraine same kind of a moraine that you'd see in mountain ranges in Colorado. Maybe you could put your cursor on that, Ben. Uh, and that moraine, uh, 90 feet tall, uh, move your moraine over there, you go to the left. Uh, that's a connection between, that's a geological connection between the base of Long Point and the base of Presque Isle. And there are those that argue, and this is a tad bit controversial, that all the sand that was washing down the lake and heading toward uh, Long Point, sometimes depending upon the currents, uh, would get loose and follow uh, that moraine and land at the base of Presque Isle, making Presque Isle uh, first cousin of Long Point. 
And uh, you could take your cursor there and put it on the Presque Isle Channel. In the old days, uh, that was uh, a river that connected the two lakes. And I guess you could see that uh, these bathyscopic pictures uh, show you different colors for different depths. So the deep part of Lake Erie is just, uh, just north of us right there. That's where it gets to be 210 feet, just off Long Point. And if you could back up to the other slide that we left, hate to make you do that. I know you can do it, there you go. Uh, you could see the uh, vestigial remains of the old shallow lake, which is light green, and uh, the deep lake on the right, which is uh, blue, so deep that it's blue. And uh, one of the explanations, this is a side story for how uh, blue pike used to live here, was uh, blue pike was a fish uh, that was, uh, was capable of spawning in the deep water. And they were blue so that predator fish could not see them, or sorry, predator birds and fish could not see them from overhead. Blue on the top, white on the bottom, unlike yellow pike, uh, which spawned on the, on the west side in the shallow water. And they were yellow on the top, so you wouldn't be able to see them because the water there is cast green versus yellow, depending upon the depths. Sorry for that tangent. No, I, I think it's fascinating. And I, I think that's one of the things that, um, uh, you know, helps us to learn our history of where the lake has come from and how it's changed. And then also the species interacting in that lake. And, and I, I, for one, found that it's one of the, um, you know, more fascinating points to, to learn about here. But I think this takes us to the $64,000 question, uh, Dr. Fru, is, is why is the water level rising? Um, I know the first the first line here says there is no consensus, but walk us through uh, what what the experts are looking at when trying to answer the question, why is the water level rising? Well, as we said before, the scientists have long been predicting long term evaporation and reductions in the in the lake. Uh, however, uh, since our last uh, high water uh, event, uh, 2017 or 2018, uh, it should have been going back down, but it did not. It kept rising. Why is it rising? Well, here we have some controversy and lack of consensus. First of all, uh, there is climate change. It's undeniable. 97% uh, of active scientists, those are people that are working in their field and publishing within six years, are saying that there is climate change. And the overall uh, impact of climate change is warming. Uh, we have had a catastrophic loss of wetlands around Lake Erie. And... Uh, should mention again that the water cannot effectively be drained. Uh, so if the water level goes down, there's uh, no good ways to add water to the lake. You could run your hose, but that water comes out of the lake before it goes back in. And there's certainly no good way of uh, getting the water out of the lake. And, and so what is causing the catastrophic loss of the wetlands? If, the, if those are so important to the ecological makeup of the region, what, what's causing that? How do we work through that? Uh, uh, home building and agriculture, uh, urban development and agriculture are wiping out uh, wetlands. So uh, we maybe have uh, eight or nine percent of the wetlands that we used to have uh, surrounding Lake Erie. And the number one, the, the number one culprit is what's been happening in the Great Black Swamp. So west of Lake Erie, there's a 1,500 square mile wetland that was always called the Great Black Swamp. And what a wetland does is uh, if you get extra water, it absorbs it like a sponge and releases it slowly. And if you don't have enough water, uh, it drains like a sponge and puts water back in. What started happening in the Great Black Swamp is that people started uh, using it for agriculture and for cow, pig, and chicken raising. And here's what's going on in the Great Black Swamp right now. Uh, about 80% of it has been converted to agriculture slash uh, like livestock. And uh, in Ohio, the way the rules and regulations uh, work regarding livestock is, let's say you happen to have a dairy farm uh, or, or a beef farm with uh, 500 cows, you'd be required uh, to gather up the cow poop, treat the cow poop, poop, emulsify it, put it in tanker trucks and haul it away. That's expensive. 
But if you happen to be uh, situated right next to a chicken farmer, a chicken farmer with 1,250 chickens, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm going to come close. Why don't you make a deal with a chicken farmer? You take him 50 of your cows and you take in return 200 of his chickens. And now all you have to do with your cow poop is spread it on the tiled fields so that as soon as it rains, uh, instead of uh, you being in a wetland now, you have a tiled field uh, with uh, stuff that you're feeding to your cows, your pigs, or your chickens. Uh, the poop uh, goes right into the tiles, drains into the Maumee River, and ends up in Lake Erie, where it creates the problem that we have with harmful algae blooms. I think what we see there is we see good intentions of trying to uh, put good policy in place, but we see the cost of that being, um, you know, it's cost prohibitive to farmers to ab abide by the regulations. And so finding some creative math to work around that so that uh, they wouldn't have to. And, and we know in Erie that the harmful algal blooms are, are a problem in our part of the lake. Yes, yes, they are, but nothing like they are in the West End where the city of Toledo has on like maybe four occasions in the last five years announced to the residents, sorry folks, no water. They didn't announce to the residents, gee, sorry folks, you're gonna have to boil your water if you wanna use it. They had to say, sorry folks, uh, we've turned off the spigot. There is no water, go to the store and buy bottles of water. And the way all this uh, wetland just disappeared and it, it couldn't happen anymore. There's rules and regulations against this is somebody's building a house and uh, they're on a piece of property that's one third wetland and they have it filled. Or a farmer thinks, well, you know, my dad ran a five, 500 acre dairy farm here for uh, 50 years and I know how this works. So I'm gonna buy the 500 acres of wetland right next door to him, uh, tile it and make it into a dairy farm and grow corn uh, while I'm doing it. Uh, one after another of those things happened, and the next thing you know, uh, it was out of control, over the top, couldn't be stopped. And again, I would welcome uh, anybody that's listening to this to dig out their Google machine and go look at the Great, La Great Black Swamp, and you can see the history of how this happens slowly. So a lot has been going on, and some of it's slow, some of it quickly, but the ongoing threats, let's recap them here, Dr. Fru. Yeah, and what gets, what gets our attention is one day when we live in Toledo and we don't have any water. We start asking, well, how did that all happen? Uh, and it happens slowly. It's like the frog in the, in the, in the tub of boiling water. Uh, first of all, uh, the threat uh, to Presque Isle and its water levels is that warming water is bigger than cooling water. Heat expands things. And I know you're thinking, gee, you know, how bad could it be if you, if you warm up the water? But the lake has not been covered by ice uh, for uh, years, with a few exceptions, short, short periods of time. Uh, this year, for the first time, and I'm an ice boater, I see people bothered putting their ice boats out of the yacht club. I'm not sure if there'll be one good day to go ice boating. And there are people ice fishing on the bay. But, uh, you know, this year, it, it didn't last as long as it used to in historic times. So the water is warmer and heat expands. There's less winter ice. So with less winter ice on the lake, there are more wa waves, they're larger waves, and they're banging against the shore. Also, we have fewer ice dunes, which exposes the shoreline. So this year, for the first year in a while, we've had significant ice dunes, which is, uh, they have a party at Presque Isle as soon as the ice dunes become significant, because they know that that's going to be very helpful. We now have uh, longer and bigger fall and spring storm surges. So as you know, in a hurricane, you know, the waves are, you know, 10 feet high, but the storm surge could be 10 or 20 feet on top of that. So the violent winds that come in spring and fall storms, nor'easters as well as northwesters, uh, they produce damaging winds and huge storm surge. There have been blowouts. We have falling trees. And I can't think of, and I'm a guy that goes to Presque Isle and walks on trails. Uh, I'm out there almost every day, year round. And, uh, you know, in the winter's past, I love the opportunity to go walking on the internal trails. Many of them are impassable because of interior, interior flooding. 
Well, I think that moves us right on to the next one, which is let's talk about the stakeholders, because I, I think that by now, if people already don't have the question in their mind, uh, they're, they're coming to it, which is what do we do about these threats? So let's review the list of stakeholders you have. Okay, here. here's, here's the people that are working on the problems of uh, water levels on Lake Erie. The United States Corps of Engineers, they have a vested interest that it's obvious because they're in charge of uh, harbors and channels. NOAA, those are the weather people. They're the people where you can go and, uh, and see what the weather is gonna be like for the next week. Uh, the International Joint Commission was formed years back to control fishing and control uh, water leaving the Great Lakes. There's always been a concern that some lunatic in New Mexico is going to want to build a pipeline from Lake Superior and drain the water so they can have lawns and golf courses. And the International Joint Commission, which is all the states surrounding the Great Lakes plus Ontario, is trying to keep, keep, keep tabs on that. Now, in terms of universities, here's the universities that have taken a special interest in Lake Erie. Guelph from Ontario, which has been working on Long Point for decades. Virginia Tech, which seems odd, but they have a couple of people that have been working with uh, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources on commercial fishing also for decades. The Ohio State Sea Grant, which has a laboratory at Put-in Bay, uh, they have a very clear interest. University of Michigan, which is interesting, or interested in the, the health of the, that lake. Uh, Columbia University and the Earth Institute, which has been charged with trying to figure out how to control uh, uh, Lake Ontario and uh, to make some deals with the St. Lawrence River. Purdue University, which has only recently been involved and they're concerned about the, uh, the burp and the schmelt industry. Schmelt is an invasive species, but it's been a huge cash crop for commercial fishermen. And uh, the schmelt crop has been deteriorating in the last several years. And Purdue has jumped into that. And Penn State University right here in Erie at Barron and our Sea Grant. These, these are the stakeholders. And I may tell you that two years ago, the International Joint Commission called a meeting at Detroit, and they brought in all the stakeholders, uh, Purdue was it there, and they asked uh, for their vision on what was going to happen to Great Lakes water levels, because they were worrying. Uh, the United States Army Corps of Engineers said, well, we don't really know, we just do straight line projections, we have historic data, but that's obviously not predicting what we need to know right now. Uh, Guelph, Virginia Tech, our state, Michigan, Columbia, and Penn State University, uh, they all jumped in and they said, we all think that the water level is going to go up three to five feet. And they were bang on. Uh, that, was an, that was an average from a meta-analysis of what they were all saying. <coughs> so a couple of years ago, when we had this IJC meeting, in Detroit, the US Army Corps of Engineers was saying, well, you guys probably know more about this than we do. Uh, we don't have theories here and you have the horsepower. And the university people were saying the, the water level is gonna go up and they were almost 100% accurate in their projections. So let's look at a meta-analysis. What, what can we expect if, if the universities are getting it right? Uh, what's on the horizon here? Well, this is the first question you asked, what's gonna happen? Of course, no one knows, uh, this is a mystery. Uh, but if you take an average of the projections from the universities uh, in the very short term, let's say three years, uh, they suspect that the water levels are gonna remain the same. They might go up or down a little bit, but not significantly in the statistical sense. Um, Midterm, five to 10 years, they're going to go up, but not significantly, maybe another couple of feet. Long term, 50 to 100 years, they're going to go back to the evaporation model and argue that they're going to go down. So from now until 50 years, uh, if you're running a marina on the, bay on the bayfront in Lake Erie, and you have a fuel tank, which is probably now underwater, and you're using that fuel tank to service uh, your customers, filling their, their yachts up with diesel or with gasoline, uh, you need to be thinking carefully about what you want to do with reconstruction or construction. So I, I think this comes to one of the biggest points. We're going to need more sand replace, replacement, uh, in, at least in the short term or as we continue to grapple with that. So we have two images on the screen here, Dr. Fru. What are we looking at? Well, in 1957, when Presque Isle executed its master plan, 
they built a, a steel spine uh, and they built it from the base of the peninsula to roughly beach six. And the steel spine was dropped into the water and cemented in place about 150 feet offshore. And then they uh, sucked up sand uh, where the marina is now. That used to be a wetland, something you could never do again. And they used that sand and also sand uh, from one of the great fish habitats inside of Presque Isle Bay, Stinkhole. They used all that sand, they sluiced it over and they spread it from the old beach to about a hundred yards past where that spine is that you see. So the picture of the young lady standing next to that spine, which is somewhere around beach six, and you can see the rock mounds too far offshore. That's an illustration that the sand that used to be a hundred yards past that is gone now. Uh, where did it go? Uh, did we capture some of it and put it back in beaches? And now that the Wisconsin glacier is not going to be providing new, new sand for us, where do we get sand? Well, we go harvest it. And there are two places where we're harvesting it. We're doing a great job of that. Uh, technically, uh, we match the Wentworth scale of the natural beach sand, un unlike what we did in the old days, which was to bring truckloads full of quarry sand and spread it on the beach. And uh, we bring some of that from the Georgian Bay where we found a place where we can buy it. And we uh, uh, dredge some of it up right offshore from Erie. And we take it to Erie Sand and Gravel. That's on the uh, other side of, uh, of the channel, uh, not the side you're looking at here. Then we hire this ship that you see that comes to us uh, and fills up with sand from Erie Sand and Gravel toddles across the uh, channel and ties up to this uh, pier that they built so that this would be available and piles the sand in piles. And if you hop in your car, drive out to the peninsula, make a hard right, uh, make a hard right and go down the Coast Guard Road, drive out to the channel, uh, you'll see these three piles of sand or four piles of sand that are there ready for patching holes and for emergencies uh, if we should have them next year. So we have to go and find the sand and stockpile it. I think that many people might think, or some people might think, that there's not really politics of this. We're seeing the water levels rise. We know that that's not what we expect should be happening, so we should take some sort of action. But we do see this being political, don't we, Dr. Frew? This has become more political than you can imagine. And... Uh... I'm, I'm watching this, I'm, I, th I think of myself as a centrist so that I can relate to the arguments on both sides. I guess I might be a little left of center. In reality, I spent my lifetime working in universities, but uh, these are uh, uh, right side slash conservative perspectives on water levels on Lake Erie. Water levels go up, they go down, they're up now, so they're gonna go down. I can't tell you how many times I hear that from you know, people that I hang out with who are my friends, they're going to go down. Well, they haven't gone down. Uh, these academic institutions, which hypothesize climate change and uh, water shifts, they're all left wing. For example, the Columbia Earth Institute, which has been charged by Governor Cuomo with trying to figure out how to, to reach some balance between Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. They're left-wing and reactionary, and there's an argument in favor of that. I mean, if you, if you don't come up with crazy reactionary things, you're probably not going to get published and you're not going to get tenure. So I guess academic institutions are more lefty than righty, and certainly the Columbia Earth Institute has earned that reputation. Uh, the International Joint Commission, which is a political organization, uh, is biased and incompetent. They can't get anything done. They can't make anything happen. These are all right side uh, perspectives. So we can't trust anything they say either. And that meeting they had in Detroit, you know, who who is to believe any of that stuff when you had an incompetent political organization gathering up a bunch of reactionary left-wing academic institutions? What about volcanoes? Don't volcanoes uh, cause as much uh, global warming as all the people driving around in gasoline cars that get 10 miles per gallon, you know, Ford F-150 trucks that we all think we need? Uh, well, 
The left side argument is, of course, volcanoes are problematic, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be a little more cautious about how much, uh, how much fossil fuel we burn. And here's a recent, here's a very recent uh, survey. Uh, if you ask, are environmental regulations worth the cost? 77% of Democrats say yes. 36% of Republicans say yes. And when you ask the Republicans for their perspective on this, they say that uh, the Democrats have no idea what the cost would be. They might be right. So, Dr. Fruis, we're here at the end and we've reviewed the politics, we've reviewed the history, we've taken a look at the threats. Um, I, I suppose looking at the immediacy of where we are, I, I can't help but think how uh, what has become more and more commonplace of people discussing and using a, a, a real number to have a conversation is uh, two degrees Celsius. Once we raise the earth more than two degrees, we're going to pass a threshold from which we cannot return. And not all folks agree on that, but many are coming to that point. Is there something with Lake Erie that's akin to that? We see the water levels reaching a certain point uh, that we know that we cannot come back from uh, that would be forever detrimental to Presque Isle? Uh, or are we still figuring this out in real time as we go? Yeah, I don't think there's a good answer to the two degree question. Uh, Radish people would say, well, where did that two degree come from? And who says you can't come back from that? We're America, we can do anything. Uh, I'm not arguing that two degrees is right or wrong, uh, but I don't know that it's 100% right. And yes, we could use a com computer model to calculate a, 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 lake a Lake Erie level that would totally wipe out Presque Isle, make it unusable. Uh, but I don't know that that's in the, in the future. Nobody is saying that the lake is gonna rise 10 feet. Well, what if it rises another six feet? Can they tolerate that? Does six, six feet put it over the top of the, of the rubble mounds and make them uh, useless? Uh, you know, these are difficult, difficult questions, but in the interim, uh, I don't think this is hopeless. I think there's things that we can all do. Uh, for one thing, we can go out and join every organization that's trying to make headway at Presque Isle. You can go to the programs, you can listen to what the park naturalists are trying to get done. You can contribute, you can join, and this came up the last time we had this chat, you can join Sons of Lake Erie, Jerry Skripsack's organization, five bucks. Who can't afford five bucks? Since I'm a generous senior guy, I give him 10 bucks and tell him to keep the change. And what does, it, what does an organization like Sons do? Well, there was a time when they had 4,000 members and they went out to the Mill Creek Mall and they said, hey, you know what you're doing here? You're allowing people to pull into your uh, parking lot, empty their ashtrays, the cigarette butts, the filters are the worst, go into Walnut Creek and they wash into Lake Erie and they louse up our fishery not to mention ca causing uh, cancer stuff to spread all the way down Walnut Creek. You've got to stop that. And the people at the Mill Creek Mall said, well, why would we do that? You know, that would cost us extra money. And the Suns guys gently said, there's 4,000 of us and we have friends. We'll help you, but you have to do something. And they did it. So there's something that your $5 membership can support that can get something done that's useful. And I, and I think for me, Dr. Fru, that that's one of the main takeaways. I'm going to end the PowerPoint uh, presentation, bring us back here uh, to the two of us. I think that's that's a main takeaway for me is that uh, there are things that we can do. Um, we can join groups. Uh, we can uh, educate ourselves better on this. What would you say for somebody saying, OK, I've listened. I'm concerned. Uh, I think I want to join. But What's my main takeaway from this presentation, having, having now learned the history of it, identified the current threats, understanding the political climate around it, what is the what should they take away? One to two things out of this, if, if you're to send them off on one or two notes. Go to the Trek website and look at the programs. Uh, go out there, go to the programs. They're all on Zoom right now because of uh, COVID, uh, but you'll get involved. Uh, join the Prescott Partnership, uh, join the light station, uh, and, and help, help people do what needs to be done there. Um, go, to the, go to Prescott, walk around, look, see, be, be a part of it. 
Dr. David Fru, JES scholar in residence and co-author of, with Jerry Skripsack, co-author of The Accidental Paradise, a 13,000 year history of Presque Isle. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, uh, taking the time, energy and effort to have this tough conversation with us, but uh, ending on a hopeful note of uh, calling people to get involved. I thank you for sharing that with us here today. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for everybody for listening. And a big thanks to the many, many, many folks who also helped in this project to get Accidental Paradise out, including the Tom Ridge Environmental Center Foundation. Uh, for more information on how, where, when uh, to get your copy of Accidental Paradise, a 13,000 year history of Presque Isle, uh, do visit the Trek Foundation's website for the book, accidentalparadise.com. And of course, like Dr. Fru said, a big thanks to all of you for tuning in, whether you're watching uh, along in real time, uh, live from the JAS Facebook page, or you're catching a uh, a later broadcast streaming on demand watching this. We thank you. Without you, this programming doesn't happen. So thank you. Uh, friendly reminder for those uh, to stream other JES uh, digital programs on demand, head over to our website, jesery.org. Uh, you're also going to find details about upcoming uh, programs as well as a wide range of publications from quick, timely reads to reports to essays and more, all available free to download, including Dr. Fru's On the Waterfront series. Uh, and of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.